start the recording sooner. That's all right. All right, so we're very excited to have our PEP2 researchers presenting to you today. They've been here since the beginning of June working on their projects, um, as with all of the PEP students. The PEP2 researchers do not take the PEP course, so they're just doing research uh, throughout the whole summer. So we're gonna give them 15 minutes to present their research and additional few minutes to talk about their Falmouth Public School collaboration. Everybody ready? Everybody excited? Yeah, okay, all right, just, just checking, okay, all right. Um, so our first presenter is Ms. Ayana Mays, and I will pull up your presentation. And I will be sitting here. I will give you a wave when you get to close to your 15 minutes, so you'll know the transition over to your, your FPS collaboration. All right, Ms. Mays. Morning, everybody. Um, thanks for showing up at eight in the morning. Um, so my name is Yana Mays. I've been working with Chris Murray and Anil Aluru at uh, Hui, and my project focuses on the hypoxia tolerance of Atlantic Riverside fish. Um, so this is just a brief outline of how the talk is going to go today. Um, we have a few different components here. So to start, we all know that climate change is causing some pretty big physical changes in our oceans. Uh, top three that I think most people are familiar with is ocean warming in terms of temperatures, ocean acidification, and then lastly, a process called deoxygenation or hypoxia, which is the presence of low levels of oxygen in water. Um, and this is especially intensified in coastal waters. Our model organism is called the Atlantic Silverside. Um, we chose this organism because it is a coastal species, so it's going to be a good indicator of how other coastal fish species are responding to the uh, hypoxia that we're seeing. And then it's also a batch spawner. So it rears its eggs up every few weeks during the spawning period. And so every time a group of eggs are brought up for fertilization, they're experiencing new environmental conditions. So this is an overview of our research that we've done. Um, in general, we wanna ask if parental environment or the environment that parents are acclimated to can actually affect the phenotypes passed down to larvae and improve their uh, fitness for those stressful conditions. And so this summer I used RNA sequencing to test how uh, parental exposure can be passed down and shown in the transcriptional profiles of our larvae or the genetic profiles of our samples. Um, so we hypothesized that parental acclimation to low oxygen is gonna cause actual changes in the genetic profiles of our larval samples. So this is our experimental design focusing on the first and the first and second column here to our phase one. Um, last year we went to Connecticut and caught adult uh, spawning um, Atlantic silversides, and we acclimated them to two separate conditions, so our control normoxic conditions and then our hypoxic low oxygen conditions. Um, we did that for two weeks, then we spawned them, fertilized their larvae, and subjected them to those same conditions, and then we gathered some data from this. So to break these groups down even further, we have our parental treatment on your left, um, so these are our control and our hypoxic fish that were acclimated under those conditions. And then we split their larvae up into two separate uh, conditions as well. So we have control larvae who come from control uh, parents and then hypoxic larvae who come from control parents as well. And then the same for our hypoxia. So we have our CC, CH, HD, and HH groups. And I'll try to keep this clear as I go through the presentation. So this is just a summary of last year's findings. Um, in general, we found that hypoxia does have a negative effect on the survival of the larvae. Um, our groups with the lowest survival have were the ones exposed to hypoxia um, themselves in the larval treatment. So looking at our CH and our HH groups here. Um, when we chunk it based off of parental group, so our CC versus our CH, these are both larvae that come from controlled parents. Um, we found that there was a significant decline in the survival of larvae as a result of the hypoxic treatment. Um, what's interesting though, is that when we look at our hypoxia acclimated groups, so our HC and our HH, these are two different fish uh, treatments that come from the same hypoxia acclimated parents. Um, what we found is that there was no significant difference in the survival of these fish. So although they were subjected to hypoxia, they were surviving about on par with the control fish that also came from hypoxic parents. And this was sort of the first inclination that hypoxia acclimation had an effect on the larvae themselves. So these were the methods that I used this summer. Um, we sampled six fish from each of our treatment groups, so 24 total. And we sent those samples to a company called Novogene in California. Um, and what this, uh, what this company sent us back were whole genomes of each of our samples. So we were able to map those to a reference genome that we have to Atlantic Silverside and make some comparisons. Um, so what came out of this was two different types of analyses. The first is called differential gene expression or DGE. And this is basically a way to say that uh, one group 
um, upregulated or downregulated these genes compared to the next. And so we compare each of our um, DGEs to our control group, our CC. And then the next analysis we did is called a GSEA analysis, which is basically a way to group um, different genes into a specific pathway. So we can say that these genes were responsible for the cardiac function pathway or for the metabolic processes pathway. And so we'll get into that a little bit later. So our first line of results that we had was our DGE analysis. Um, like I said, it, it's a comparison. And what we're looking at on this Venn diagram is a comparison of two comparisons. So looking just on the green bubble here, we see our CC versus our HH. So we're looking at our fully hypoxic larvae compared to our control. And basically what we found is that there were 1,503 genes differentially expressed between these two groups. Um, we look on the orange bubble here on, our, on your right, and we're comparing our CC versus our CH, and then we found that this had 1,573 genes differentially expressed. And so both of these um, groups here, our HH and our CH, both of these were larvae that were exposed to hypoxic treatments. Um, what's interesting though, is that although they got the identical treatment of low oxygen, only 692 of the genes differentially expressed were similar between them. So they are responding to our hypoxic treatment, but it seems in different ways. And we're thinking it's likely due to the parental acclimation that the CH were brought up or that the HH were brought up under. So this is further into our differential gene expression um, analysis. What we're looking at is basically plots of all of the genes differentially or non-differentially expressed between two uh, groups. So on our far, um, left, we have our CC versus our HH. This is from the Venn diagram that we just saw. In the blue, these are significantly downregulated genes on this side and upregulated genes on this side here. And so we can see that there were a number of significant genes different from our CC to our HH. In the black on the bottom, we have non-significantly differentially expressed genes. So these are genes that were similar across groups. And then in the green, we have genes that had particularly large or small log flow changes. And basically, you can think of these genes in green as genes that didn't quite make the cutoff for statistical significance, but they were pretty close. And so we gather some biological uh, significance from them in our analysis. Um, so we're looking at our CC our, versus our HH, and then coming to the middle here, we see our CC versus our HC. And so these are larvae that were exposed to identical control treatments. So both brought up under normal oxygen conditions. And so since the treatments were identical, we actually didn't see any genes differentially expressed despite them coming from different um, acclimated parents. This is our GSEA analysis. Um, so like I said, on the y-axis, we have those different pathways that were grouped together from our samples. And then on our X, we have our normalized enrichment score, which is basically a way to say that um, one pathway is activated or upregulated, well, um, or suppressed or downregulated. So across our comparisons, we have synaptic signaling as a um, highly upregulated pathway. We can see that in the color of our, um, of our bubbles. We have synapse assembly, uh, neurotransmitter transport, um, what's interesting though is that in our CC versus our HC in the middle, um, again, these are control larvae, so they weren't themselves exposed to hypoxia, but they're showing similar upregulation and downregulation of the same pathways to actual larvae that have themselves been exposed. Um, someone entered the waiting room, should I admit? Sure. Mm -hmm. I just want to open up some. Oh, well, sorry, it was in. Like everybody. I just admit, I just hit the Okay, I'm just gonna mute everybody. Okay, sorry. Just the right one? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. So this is basically a summarization of our um, pathways that we saw up or down regulated. So again, up regulated, we saw things like synaptic signaling, neurotransmitter transport, um, signaling neurotransmitter regulation. So a lot of um, neurological activity is being up regulated or signaling activity is being up regulated as a result of our hypoxic treatment. Um, and then down regulated, we have things like ribosome biogenesis, uh, amino acid biosynthesis, um, metabolic processes. So in general, we can tell that hypoxia is having um, a negative effect on processes like these on the downregulated side, likely because um, hypoxia is very uh, taxing on these organisms. And so they often don't have the energy or the metabolic expense to spend on things like synthesizing proteins. And so this is why we see, you know, stunted development or um, lower survival in larvae that are exposed to hypoxia. Would you click on it? Yes. Okay. 
So this is our last um, result that I'm showing here today. This is a heat map of all of the genes within the synaptic signaling pathway. And so across the top here, we can see our different treatment groups. And then each row is a gene within the synaptic signaling pathway. And so basically, we can look at the colors of this graph and say, OK, bluer colors are lo little response to our hypoxia, and then warmer red colors are more response. And so we're looking at our control, our CC on the far um, left. And we can see that there's little response to our hypoxic treatment because they weren't exposed to those um, stressful environmental conditions. And then looking on the other extreme in our HH, we're seeing a lot more of those red colors, um, so more response in this uh, synaptic signaling pathway. Um, so we chunk it based off of larval groups. So looking at our HH compared to our CH, both of these got the same identical low oxygen treatment as larvae, and we're seeing a sort of similar pattern between them. Um, and then looking at our CC versus our HC, so these are fully control larvae. The only difference between them is that our HC comes from parents who were exposed to hypoxia. And so what's interesting is that these profiles aren't identical. And so it seems that HC is serving as sort of an intermediary between our CC and our HH group, indicating that although they weren't themselves exposed to hypoxia, some sort of priming has been passed down from their hypoxia acclimated parents to the larvae. So to summarize, in general, um, both of our hypoxia groups, our CH and our HH um, larvae, over half of their genes were differentially expressed and unique to each group. Um, so they are responding to that hypoxic treatment just in different ways. Um, and we're hypothesizing that it's due to the different parental acclimation. Um, our expressional profile that we just saw of our HC served as sort of an intermediary. So it's not quite fully controlled and it's not quite responding as drastically as our HH group, but there is, um, it does indicate some sort of priming is being passed down from parent to offspring. And so all of these sort of point to the idea that there's some evidence that hypoxic exposure actually uh, alters the transcriptional profiles of the larvae we saw. So in general, we found that there is a possible mechanism for offspring to rapidly adapt to changing environmental conditions. Um, what we don't know, however, is if this uh, mechanism is adaptive or maladaptive. So we can't say for sure that it better puts them in a better position to survive um, in, in stressful conditions as their parents were. Um, but we can't say for certain that it puts them in a worse position. Um, so there's trade-offs and we kind of have to sort through the, um, the evidence a little bit more. But we do know that if it is indeed adaptive, then there is potential for climate resilience within this species and for other coastal species who may respond in the same way. So I'd just like to thank my mentors, Chris and Neil, for all their help, Timo and Anji for making this program so great, and then all partners and people in support of Fed. Oh, questions, comments, concerns? I have a question. Yeah. So last year, you worked on this project, mm -hmm. similar, a different part of this project. Yeah. And I asked you if you could come back, what would you do? You did this. Yeah. <laughs> and then I did it. Which is awesome. So if you had an opportunity to do more research mm -hmm. or had more money or could come back again, what, what would be the next steps? Um, so in the broad scheme of things, we would go to the next generation, which we saw in the experimental design, and see if even though the larvae themselves weren't um, exposed, even as gametes in their mothers, if they're still showing the same pattern. So that would show kind of more proof of transgenerational um, like plasticity or uh, epigenetic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how do I move to the... Stop share real quick. Oh, this is weird. So the second aspect of the PEP2 program is to collaborate with Falmouth Public Schools. So I and my teacher, Tina Mapp, in the back, um, we decided to get together and figure out how to teach the scientific method to her students. So the knowledge gap that we're generally trying to fill is that um, we know that students don't really have much experience using the scientific method. Um, there's the occasional science fair in which you pick like a pre-made science, uh, science project, but you don't really get to explore the fullness of um, the method and go from making an observation to getting some actual conclusions. And so we're looking to introduce that. So we have some goals that um, were transformed into specific learning objectives. So the first goal is in general, we wanna stoke the curiosity of the students about the processes happening around them. 
And so to do that, we want students to choose a topic of their own, uh, of their own choosing that they have general, genuine interest in. And then next we wanted to give students um, actual experience using the scientific method, like I said. So we're gonna allow them to um, design an experiment that answers the question that they chose. And then last, we want them to think critically about how to solve um, unknowns um, and then think about the importance of their work. So we want them to explain why their experimental design is sufficient to answer their question and then what the implications of their findings are. Um, so my teacher introduced me to something called the 5E teaching method. Um, basically, this is just a way to make sure that your lesson is com comes across effectively to the student. So the first step is engagement. So you wanna introduce the topic in a way that captures the student's interest. Then we want them to explore that understanding that they have, um, explore that understanding that they have uh, on a surface level. Then we want them to be able to explain what their understanding is thus far. And then elaboration, which is where we teach uh, vocabulary skills um, and other things within that topic that they need to become uh, proficient in. And last, we wanna evaluate their understanding of, the, uh, of, their, of their, under their understanding of the topic. Um, so the first step uh, is engagement. I found a really nice video that kind of introduces the scientific method in a way that allows them or that encourages them to uh, be curious about the world around them. So when kids are younger, they ask all sorts of questions like, why is the sky blue? Um, why are some people stronger than others? Why does this route to school take longer? So we want to stoke that curiosity in these kids, even though they've kind of grown past that. I'm going to admit again. Um, so the next was exploration and explanation. So for our assignment, we just wanted them to get in groups of three or four um, and then think about a question that they're curious about. And then hypothetically, if they had unlimited resources to design an experiment that would answer that question. Um, and then lastly, just explain their findings to the classroom. Then elaboration, this is where you teach things like the null and alternative hypothesis, independent and dependent variables, and then ways they can perform background research for their topic. And then I would demonstrate with my own research. So breaking down my independent and dependent, dependent variables and my um, research, um, breaking down the background and implications that I learned. And then we could just reinforce with the game, a simple Kahoot, which kind of tests their knowledge of their understanding. So lastly is the evaluation. Um, this is sort of like what all of the work is uh, mounting to. We want them to design their own independent experience, experiment. Um, and to emphasize critical thinking, we wanna emphasize what the implications and possible outcomes of their experiment are. So we want them to think about, think beyond what just the results were, but think about what it could mean on the broader scale. And so I just wanted to leave with a quote, which I feel like summarizes our goals um, of curiosity in students. The future belongs to the curious, the ones who are not afraid to try it, explore it, poke at it, question it, and turn it inside out. Thank you. Any questions for Ayana? <laughs> About her teacher project or? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ayana. Right. Our next Miles said amazing presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. Okay. Our next presenter is Mr. Jose Cabral. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jose Cabral, a PEP2 researcher um, from the University of Texas at El Paso. And this summer, I had the opportunity to work within the protected species branch of NOAA Fisheries um, in collaboration with Sean Hayes and Daniel Koyak. My project looks at the assessment of finwell habitat use and connectivity relative to marine protected areas in the Gulf of Maine and their implications for management. 
Um, so why fin whales? So fin whales are the second largest species of whales and are an endangered species. And at NOAA fisheries, little is known about their habitat use and whether the current network of marine protected areas is adequately protecting um, the species aspect of life. So why, okay, so protected areas are, are zones established um, to conserve, restore, and understand um, the protected areas' na natural biodiversity. And in the image, we can see all of our region's um, current network of marine protected areas, all highlighted in different colors. Um, and in pink, we have the Bowen um, Wind Farm lease area. And in white, we have the Bowen Wind Farm um, planning area. Um, so uh, an MPA of focus for this project was Del Wagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Um, this sanctuary has very productive waters that's made it famous for its fishing grounds and its returning of whales, including fin whales. Um, there's a lot going on here um, bio biologically and, um, and, and its uses for and its implications for fisheries. Um, so for our project, we wanted to understand site fidelity, habitat usage, and occupancy of marine protected areas. We wanted to evaluate foraging behavior and assess connectivity and anthropogenic risk. So we collected data. So data was collected in the summer of 2022 using limplet splash, splash satellite telemetry tags, which provide horizontal um, movement, which is basically telling us where the animals are within the ocean. Um, they also provide depth and temperature time series and dive behavior. So the tags were deployed. Um, so eight tags were deployed between the 28th of June and the 4th of July. Uh, they were deployed north of Point Racing of North of Racing Point Beach. Um, you can see the exact tag locations and the stars the image provided, and all of the individuals were biopsied for sex and future hormone analysis. So this image shows all the tracks uh, overlapped over our marine protected areas. The tracks were derived from our tag data. Um, seven tags provided usable data, and the tag duration varied from 7.3 days to 96 days, with a mean duration tag duration of 35.1 days. So um, again, our marine protected areas all highlighted in different colors. And in green now, we have our um, Bowen wind farm lease area. So our dive, looking at our dive data, so this is an example of, so this is tag uh, 234800. Um, this tag had a dive duration of 35.7 days and 1,645 dives were recorded. Um, this track is very interesting because we can see the individual move from our study region down to the Bowen wind farm. Um, lease area. For this individual, for tag 803, at a duration of 20.6 days and 630 dives were recorded. Um, this tag is, um, so this tag is notable because for almost the entirety of its tag duration, it spent itself, it spent within our marine protected areas. And this tag um, was very similar to tag 798, 801, 802, and 805. So a couple of our individuals had very similar um, uh, movement patterns, and they were all within our marine protected areas. So in order to determine our foraging behaviors and our transitory behaviors, we ran our tag data through a state-based model, which is just a mathematical um, Presentation of our physical of our physical system, and in the red we can see um, in the red is our foraging behaviors, which is our ARS or area restricted search, which is categorized by um, frequent course reversals and relatively low um, slow swim speed speeds, and in the purple or in the blues um, we have our transitory behaviors, which are indicative of faster movements and persistence within. Um, within location. So, um, and then this is an image showing all the tracks, all of our, um, all of our tracks over, um, all of our tracks showing our foraging and transitory behaviors. So an example of this is again, track 800, 84.7% of all of its dives were um, indicative of foraging behavior. 
7.7% of the dives were indicative of transitory behavior and had a daily average of 26.6 .6 meters average maximum depth. And this is the track we can see how it forged on the north side of, of the Cape, then made its way down to our other area of interest, our wind farm lease area. But a notable thing to a thing to note about this track is that this uh, individual in particular had no interest in, in forging um, between these two locations. It like, knew exactly where it needed to go. Um, and you can see its path like from point A to point B, have places to go, places to be. Um, for track 803, 95.3% um, of the dogs were categorized um, or indicative of foraging behavior. Uh, only 2.4% of the dives were in transit or in transitory. And again, um, within our marine protected areas and very, um, I guess, just very localized to our, our areas and very restricted. Um, so the discussion is all of our, our seven tags were it's notable to mention that our seven tags are all come from different pods. These are all different wells, different families, different. Um, they all have their own different motivation, thoughts, personalities, personalities, whatever, X, Y, and Z. Um, however, they all displayed high site fidelity to our marine protected areas, specifically Selwagon Bank, Cape Cod Bay um, Ocean Sanctuary, and Cape Cod Ocean Sanctuary. Um, they displayed high. Um, Foraging, they displayed um, large foraging behaviors within our existing network of marine protected areas and within our other areas of interest, including the Boehm uh, wind farm lease area. So some of the anthropogenic risk that these animals might encounter are muscle strikes and fishing gear entanglements are still the primary risk for fin whales, um, but also wind farm developments could contribute to ocean noise and could interrupt current feeding ground. So this is an image, again, a closer look at our wind farm lease area where one of our um, tagged individuals foraged. And in the other image, we can see uh, gear density um, for the summer months within our area. And some of the implications of management, well, this research aimed at providing a baseline of understanding the fin whale's habitat use. And in order to um, so we want to provide our data products to managers to assess whether our marine protected areas um, are, offer sufficient resilience to fin whales. And in order to do this, we need to continue and expand our current investigation of fin whales uh, via um, tagging efforts. Thank you. <laughs> do I have any questions? Yes. Similar. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're all from different pods. Um, but they the the behavior that they displayed was very similar. Um, and the areas in which they foraged were also very similar. So they foraged. Um, let me just go back. So they decided to forage, um, I like this one, yeah. Forage really on the southern tip of Selwagon Bank and the northern side of Cape Cod Bay um, with very few um, deviations and variations from the allocation. Um, do we have any more questions? Yes. What's drawing whales? I'm sorry? What's drawing whales? Um, so, I like to think of it as if you're invited to a buffet <laughs> and there's food provided, um, why leave, right? So um, we don't know exactly what is driving our animals there, but we can assume that it's it's feeding and foraging and um, other social behaviors that are kind of being displayed around these areas. Yeah. Okay, that's a that's a very valid and very good question. So, I am a geophysicist 
a geophysics major from the University of Texas at the desert state of El Paso, the desert city of El Paso. Um, and now I'm working at NOAA Fisheries and looking at some tag data of fin whales. So um, it was just learning curve after learning curve after learning curve, but it was amazing. I had a great opportunity and um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about animal behaviors. I didn't even know that fin whales existed. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was just really happy that I was able to be part of this project and be able to give my contributions and my inputs and take from it. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So what I've learned from this project that I'm taking home personally, it might not be fin whales and not, and it might not be, you know, the data that we worked on, but Definitely the processes and the methods, the scientific method, um, it's the way of, of setting up a project, developing, thinking creatively, and science communication, all of that has its implications further down to my career. Um, yeah, and coding too, <laughs> everything, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, ready for part two? Okay, so. So my collaboration with Falmouth Public Schools um, with Christina Woods um, was a collaborative. So we developed a couple of lesson plans on collaborative ocean planning of marine protected areas of coastal Massachusetts. So I wanted to highlight one of the lesson plans that we created, which were um, looking at ocean stakeholders, specifically in regards with um, offshore wind farms. So this is a lesson plan that was developed. So these are some of the essential questions. So the target audience actually is uh, seventh grade students. So the tar um, some of the essential questions for the students to kind of keep at the back of their mind while we're kind of going through our activities um, include of like, what does it mean to be a stakeholder? Do marine life and marine ecosystems have a voice? Or why might there be conflicts over the use of the ocean? Um, the objectives of this lesson plan is to discuss the term discuss the term stakeholder, engage in an argument from evidence that they gather and brainstorm, obtain, evaluate, and communicate information, and compile multiple perspectives to create a best practice plan. So kind of bring everyone's opinion, everyone's um, perspective together into an all-encompassing plan at the end. Um, so the first activity is brainstorming a stakeholder. How are you considered a stakeholder? What is a stakeholder? Um, what is an offshore wind farm and um, who might be a stakeholder at the conversation? Who could be a stakeholder um, when considering an offshore wind farm? These are some of the examples, aquaculture, fishing, military, um, re recreation, shipping. Um, and this is where the students kind of research, talk through some of these um, examples and, and then so we, we, after this, we divide them into groups. They choose which of the stakeholders they want to research. They research uh, and they, they research um, the stakeholder in relation to the offshore wind farm. Um, as they are doing this, so there's a video that discusses wells and wind farms and how wind farms might not always be um, beneficial or they might be risk involved for some certain stakeholders. So, so there's that. and then. The students are determining their priorities regarding um, their stakeholder that they have chosen in regards to <clears throat> in regards to the offshore wind farm. The next step is priorities. This is where they prepare the priorities to give a presentation, a three to five minute presentation to the class. And from here, okay, so then from here, each of the students will present their presentation, their stakeholder presentation. Um, while they're presenting, the students will take notes. Then, as a class, we create an all-encompassing plan based on what everyone has, all the different stakeholders have said, to then have an all-encompassing um, plan that prioritizes everyone's um, concern. From here, the reflection of this would be, um, from here, we get to the reflection, and there's the video, and we discuss um, some of the reflection points, such as, um, how are you able to relate to stakeholders that you represented in the classroom? 
Um, how do you think, how do you, how do the needs of future generations might affect the decisions being made across our oceans today? And why do you think building trust is so important when deciding critical issues that affect whole communities and ecosystems? So kind of basically walking through the students, students um, and finding their voice, creating a project, not creating a project, but creating um, an argument in which they debate, discuss, and then we collaborate at the end. Thank you. Back. So would this be a conference over the course of uh, a week, or would this be like a one day? Conference? Yeah. So this is a a multiple day, multiple um, um, multiple. It's a multifaceted sub um project that's, that's ongoing um but it's really fun and really engaging and i wish i had this lesson plan as a student <laughs> yes um one aspect of this that you see it lends itself to just social justice social environmental justice. justice oh absolutely and for the knowledge of students to see themselves their family their community and that's an excellent question and i feel like this project in particular this lesson plan in particular really helps students find their voice find a voice and being able to argue for something um whether it be you know being able to argue for something and it has serious implications when it comes to students of color and environmental justice and finding their voice and saying that I need to be heard. This is my priorities and this is what matters for me, my community and my my environment when it comes to X, Y, and Z, whether it be development or anything else. Thank you. Miles said, loved your presentation, and Jordan said, great work. <laughs> and our final presentation is Alicia Yadlowski. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Alicia Yadlowski. I'm a recent graduate. I just graduated in May, actually, of um, the illustrious North Carolina A&T State University. Um, so this summer, I worked on a project on salt marsh ecology, and I also worked on a project on anti-fouling measures. Um, so this summer, I worked with my mentors, Dr. Rachel Jacuba and Dr. Lara Goldman um, at Buzzards Bay Coalition. And so first I wanna make it clear that these are two separate projects and they're dealing with two separate um, uh, long-term programs, long-term monitoring programs and research that Buzzards Bay Coalition does. So first I'd like to start off by showing a map of all of the sites that Buzzards Bay Coalition does research on. So in yellow here, we have, um, in yellow here we have, uh, water quality monitoring sites. So here, Buzzards Bay conducts water quality monitoring. I'll talk about that a lot more in a second. And the blue markers represent the salt marsh study sites. So first I'll go into the salt marsh ecology research that Buzzards Bay Coalition does. So in order to gain some information about the species of salt marsh crabs living in salt marshes across Buzzards Bay, um, Buzzards Bay Coalition does uh, crab trapping. So how this works is um, at each of the 12 marshes for, um, for, uh, for one day out of the summer, um, they go to the salt marsh and they take tennis ball cans, they dig a little hole in the, in the salt marsh and they place the can inside. And it's just, it acts as a pitfall trap for the crabs. So what happens is the crab's just walking along and it falls inside or it walks inside because it thinks it's a burrow. 
And so after 24 hours, they're recovered and the crab inside can then be measured and identified and counted. So here's some pictures showing uh, field work being done with the crab trapping. So on the left here, we have somebody measuring the carapace width of a crab. And on the right here, we have me using a soil core to uh, make a hole to make room for the trap. Okay, next I'll talk about the water quality monitoring that Buzzards Bay Coalition does. So in order to gain some information about the health of the bay and better understand um, water quality baywide, um, Buzzards Bay Coalition deploys uh, data loggers into the water. And those collect information while they're down there about um, a bunch of different variables, including temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen. And then from that, some other uh, measurements, some other variables can be calculated, such as oxygen percent saturation. And so in order to make sure these loggers don't escape, they're expensive pieces of equipment, um, they're secured to a frame. So you can see it here in the picture, it's secured to a milk crate and then tied to a line, which is secured to the dock. And so while these uh, loggers are in the water, um, they stay there long-term for a period of months. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they take measurements every 10 minutes and they store that data on them, which, they, which can then be recovered later. So this is a picture of the frames that the loggers are secured to. Um, you can see the loggers themselves on top of that one and sort of attached to the sides of this pyramid here. This one is made out of stainless steel and that one is a milk crate. So next I'd like to talk about uh, the focus of my project this summer, which was biofouling. So biofouling is a process by which marine organisms start to settle on equipment that's in the, in the water long-term, such as these data loggers. So what happens over time is that organisms start to settle inside the sensors or all over the body of the instrument. As you can see here, there's that little indentation on the end of that instrument is the sensor, and it's been totally clogged up by organisms growing there. And this has bad implications on the quality of the data that's recorded. Um, so obviously that's something that we wanna avoid. So there are steps that we can take to prevent this from happening. For example, on the last slide, I'll go back. This metal pyramid is made of stainless steel in an attempt to prevent organisms from settling on it. Unfortunately, not all anti-fouling measures are effective. Um, some are more effective than others. Uh, for example, here you can see on the metal frame, on the stainless steel frame, uh, there's been some growth of organisms. That's the picture on the left there. On the right, we have the loggers themselves, and we have, you know, we, we can see that there was a lot of growth of organisms. This is a pretty extreme case of that. So how does the biofouling that happens on these instruments actually affect the data? So the main effect that fouling has on data itself is that it makes it very hard to interpret what, da what data is real, which values are real, and which values are just uh, occurring because there's fouling on the sensors. Um, so we can see a really significant decrease in dissolved oxygen, dissolved oxygen concentration here that's measured in milligrams per liter, and that's on the y-axis there. Uh, time uh, date is on the x-axis. So we can see that over time, um, the values we're measuring for DL drop drastically. And it's, hard, it's really hard to determine whether that's something real that was happening in that system. Um, this data is coming from a site called Redbrook Harbor. Um, it's hard to tell if that was real data, there was a real decrease in DO because of something environmental happening or just because of the fouling. Okay, so now I'll highlight my research questions that I asked this summer. For my salt marsh crab data analysis project, um, there were a couple of questions that I had to kind of guide that analysis. So those questions include, what species are we seeing at which sites? Um, are we catching more crabs in certain trap habitats? Uh, like on the platform or near the creek? Uh, does carapace width vary site to site? And finally, is there a correlation between the number of burrows counted on a square meter transect and the number of crabs we catch per trap? And then for my anti-fouling uh, project, I took a look at the questions, which anti-fouling methods are more effective than others? 
how often should we be cleaning the loggers to make sure we get the best data possible? And which fouling organisms are we seeing on the loggers? I'll start out by talking about my uh, salt marsh crab data project. Um, so this graph shows the average number of crabs uh, captured per trap. And this shows that over time. So on the x-axis here, we have, um, we have our sites. And I'll be showing a legend for that. So this makes a little bit more sense. So basically, each site is assigned a three-letter code. Um, for example, this one on the end here, GSM is Great Sipawisit Marsh. And uh, in the different colors here, we have different years. And so we can see that a different number of crabs are caught on average uh, per trap every single year. There's some variation over time. So next, I'd like to introduce our cast of characters here, the, um, the crab species that we typically see in the marsh. So on the far left, we have Ucapugnax. And then we have Uka pugilator. These are mud fiddler and sand fiddler crabs, respectively. Um, then we have Sasarma reticulatum, the purple marsh crab. So something interesting about Sasarma is that um, in some places in Massachusetts, it seems as though um, Sasarma is overgrazing on marsh grasses, and it's actually starting to cause some vegetation loss. Um, it seems as though their populations are higher than usual, and so they're overgrazing. And then finally, we have, um, oh, I would like to mention, though, it is a native species, so that's something interesting. Um, finally, we have Carcinus manus, uh, the European green crab. These are non-native, and they're a bigger crab species than the others here. We have something, somebody in the way. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about the distribution of crab species across different sites. So on the far right here, we have um, a legend showing uh, the colors I've assigned and also the code names for each one of these marshes. Like as I explained before, each one has a three letter code and um, those are listed along the bottom again. And right above that, we have a legend showing the colors and code names assigned to each species of crab. Okay, so this graph is showing that in orange here, we have Ucapugnax, um, the mud fiddler crab, and clearly we're seeing a lot more of those being captured than all other crab species, um, especially at the LHA, Little Harbor Beach. Um, so yeah, uh, it seems as though the vast majority of crabs we're catching are Ucapugnax. And that's backed up by if you go into the salt marsh and you, you see crabs everywhere, you're going to be seeing a lot of Ucapugnax. It's mostly just fiddler crabs on the marsh. Something, uh, something else that we can determine from this figure is that um, Cisarma reticulatum is found at um, some of the sites, but not all of them. They seem to also be geographically clustered in one area. So the order of these sites um, on the x-axis is um, going from west to east, uh, left to right. So it seems though Sasarma is only in one section and not uh, further west. And they're also not found at Great Sipawisit Marsh uh, further east. All right, next I'd like to talk about my findings for platform versus creek. So what this means is um, there are two different places where traps can be placed on the salt marsh either on the salt marsh platform or right next to the creek. Um, so at low tide, there's a little creek and you know, you place the traps right there or um, further back in like more highly vegetated spots, um, way further away from the creek, that's the platform. And so what we're seeing here is that, um, well, first let me explain. Uh, we have the average number of crabs per trap on the y-axis and uh, crabs caught on the platform are in blue and crabs caught near the creek are in red. Um, we seem to be pretty consistently catching uh, crabs on the platform versus near the creek, which is interesting because if you go to the salt marsh, there are a lot more crabs near the creek than on the platform. This is a picture of um, many Ucapugnax uh, right next to the creek. Um, there are a lot more burrows near the creek. And it's, it's really an interesting result because it's not what we were expecting at all. 
this is another graph pretty much showing the same thing, except divided by uh, time ex uh, instead of site. So here we can see that even though there's variation in the number of crabs we're catching on average uh, per year, the ratio of uh, crabs caught on the platform versus crabs caught on the creek uh, pretty much stays the same. Next, I'll talk about carapace width. So this was another variable we looked at. And this graph is just showing the um, all-time average over all sites of what the, um, what the ranges of carapace width typically are for these crabs. So in green, we have green crabs. And these are, on average, a lot bigger than the other crabs. There are bigger species, so it makes sense. Uh, Cisarma is a little bigger, on average, than Uca pugnax or Uca pugilator. And uh, then we also have just general fiddlers, um, unidentified fiddlers, so either Uca pugnax or Uca pugilator. And then unidentified crabs are typically just those that are too small to identify. Okay, so this graph is showing the variation in carapace width over different sites. So I know these bars are a little bit small, so it may be hard to see, but I'll explain what these results kind of mean. Um, so it looks like there are, for some reason, larger green crabs at Little Harbor Beach. Um, we can also see here that there's not a ton of variation in the size of Uca pugnax in orange across different sites. They're all relatively in the same range. Um, there's a little bit of variation in size for um, Cisarma reticulatum, but again, not a lot. Uh, they don't seem to vary more than like one centimeter in uh, carapace width from each other. And so for a topic of future research might be to compare this data with some other factors like say, uh, are there different nutrient levels at different sites that can explain why we're seeing different sizes? Um, so yeah, that might be something that future analysis could take a look at. Next, I'll talk about crab numbers versus burrow numbers. So in addition to trapping crabs on the salt marsh, um, Buzzards Bay Coalition also separately does a project where they take square meter transects and count the number of burrows within them. And those are separate from the areas where they do the trapping. But it does. it is a good indicator of crab activity in general in the past at that location. So we were hoping that uh, trapping crabs and counting them would give us sort of an indicator as to how much crab activity or how many crabs were on the salt marsh. But it seems that after doing an analysis of uh, the data uh, of how many crabs were captured versus the number of burrows, which is a good indicator of crab activity, uh, there's no correlation, uh, just not what we were expecting. So this means that uh, this means that we may not be able to make any quantitative uh, conclusions about uh, the number of crabs that are on these salt marshes, just based on the number of crabs that we're catching. It seems that that sample that we're getting is not an accurate indicator of the actual number of crabs on the marsh. And so I just want to explain real quick that these graphs, um, they have a bunch of little colored dots. These all correspond to the colors assigned to different sites. Okay, so that's it for the crab data. Now I'd like to talk about my anti-fouling measures project. So first we tested cleaning frequency. So uh, what this means is normally the loggers are cleaned uh, once every seven days. So they pull the equipment out of the water, they rinse everything down with a rinse bottle, scrub it if necessary to make sure there's no gunk in the sensors, to make sure that everything's still clean, and then it's redeployed. So that's done every seven days normally. So we decided to test cleaning more often every four days to see if it would make a difference. And this was done at a site called Redbrook Harbor, um, the same as the sort of messed up uh, foul data graph that I showed before. So Redbrook Harbor is a site that experiences pretty a, rapid, a pretty rapid rate of fouling. So this was why we chose this site. We were originally going to use the site Quisset Harbor, but it seems as though fouling doesn't happen very quickly at that site. So this was a better site for our experiment. So we wanted to see if cleaning more often uh, has an impact on the quality of the data. 
So this graph shows the, the results from that. Uh, in red, we have the data collected from the normal logger. And in blue, we have the data from the fouling experiment logger, referred to as the fouling logger. Um, and the little stars indicate when each one was uh, when each one was clean. So in blue, that one was cleaned um, every four days. In red, that was cleaned every seven days. And so what we can see here is on the far left towards the beginning when they were first deployed, you can see that they start to vary a little bit. Uh, the red line starts to dip a little lower in value than the blue line. Um, and that stops right after it was cleaned, after both loggers were cleaned. So what this means is um, perhaps there was some fouling that occurred on the logger that was not cleaned as often, and it just didn't happen to occur on the fouling experiment logger. But after they're cleaned, they match up again. These were placed side by side in the same environment um, at Red Brook Harbor. So uh, it's interesting to see the variation between them, even though they were side by side. Some variation might be accounted for just because they were in different spots, not placed on the same frame. But some of it might be because of fouling. It's a little bit hard to tell, honestly, and future experiments might want to put a camera down there or put multiple loggers on the same frame to see if there's variation between those. But what we see here is that there's not a whole lot of difference between the data collected by the two loggers, but there is a visible difference. So it may be a little better for the sake of the data quality to clean more often than just one week, at least for this site because every site is different and some experience slower fouling. Oh, I'm sorry. So what this graph is showing is dissolved oxygen concentration over time. Uh, so that's the variable that these loggers were tracking over time. So our next experiment about anti-fouling measures was uh, to test the effectiveness of different materials. So um, in order to do this, we secured these decoy loggers to a frame. So these are just syringe tubes. Uh, they're good stand-ins for loggers. They're roughly the same size. And um, so we took two different anti-fouling materials and applied them to uh, two of our uh, test groups. And each one of those groups had uh, four of these tubes. So we applied um, a nanopolymer spray called sea spray to one of the test groups. And we wrapped the other ones in nylon stockings to see which was the more effective anti-fouling material. And this experiment was deployed and ran for one month, totally underwater without being cleaned or anything. And so what we can see is that obviously for our controls, we had the growth of some organisms. We can see um, there are a little more than 20 barnacles that grew on the surface of these tubes. Uh, we also saw some growth of colonial tunicate species. Uh, Botrylis schlosseri is a colonial tunicate that we saw growing on these. We also saw growth of barnacles and two different species of colonial tunicates uh, on the sea spray. So what this means is that sea spray is not an effective way of preventing fouling. It was advertised as an anti-fouling spray and also that it would make it easier to clean the equipment, but neither of those claims were true, unfortunately. Uh, so that would not be something worth investing in in the future to protect the loggers. Finally, the stocking uh, did prove effective. Uh, it only saw the growth of two very small barnacles uh, that could only be seen under a microscope. And so it seems that stocking is an effective anti-fouling measure. The only potential problem with stocking as an anti-fouling measure is that um, it may be limited in its application just because if you put it on a logger, there's the potential for mud to get stuck in it and it might clog up the sensor. It might obstruct the flow of water to the sensor. So it may not be usable. So these pictures just show the different types of organisms that grew on our tubes and the middle picture is showing the frame. So we have barnacles and the two colonial tunicate species right there. Okay, so what conclusions can we draw from all of these experiments? So first of all, for the crab data, we can conclude that definitely the most common species of crabs that we caught were fiddler crabs, definitely a lot of Ucapugnax. Um, we can also say more crabs were caught on the platform than near the creek. Um, it might be good in the future for 
future research to take a look at why this is happening. We speculate that um, the crab traps placed near the creek, um, the crabs might be able to escape from them when they flood. So the creek, we place the traps at low tide and at high tide, then the crabs might be able to just swim out. Um, so that might be, that's one theory as to what's happening, why we're catching so few crabs at the creek when there are so many of them there. Um, so yeah, that would make an interesting topic for future research. We also, we also found that carapace width varies slightly across different sites. Again, this might also be a future research topic. And finally, for crab data, there's no correlation between the number of burrows in one square meter and the number of crabs uh, on average captured in salt marsh. Now onto the anti-fouling conclusions. Um, cleaning every four days instead of seven does make a slight difference in data. We did see a difference in it. And, um, and yeah, that, that might be a good thing to do going forward in uh, fast fouling sites. So finally, sea spray is not an effective anti-fouling measure, but stockings are effective on these decoy loggers, but uh, their effectiveness on real loggers is debatable. So that might be something that could be tested. Okay, so I'm gonna go real quick to my acknowledgements. Uh, thank you so much to my mentors, uh, Laura and Rachel. Thank you guys so much for your help. It's been a really awesome summer. I've learned so much. I really didn't know anything about crab biology and now I know how to identify salt marsh crabs and that's great. I really had a great time getting out into the field. Doing the data analysis was super interesting. So. Thank you so much for teaching me so much and helping me along the way. I also would like to thank um, uh, other employees of Buzzard Bay Coalition, Tony Williams and Calista McPherson for helping out with field work that I was doing. Uh, field work was a lot of fun. I'd also like to thank um, uh, Woods Hole Partnership Education Program. Thank you to Monet and Anji. Um, you guys are the best. Thank you so much for everything. And thank you guys for the opportunity to do research here again. So it's um like those nylon like sheer socks that you'd wear sometimes if you're we wearing like dress shoes. It's um or like tights material. Uh, it's that it's sort of like a sheer mesh. And so it was just a household item and we thought we might as well test it. Um, you said that like now um, organisms were like getting in the way of like sensory disadvantage from the bio Do you know what organisms are causing the biggest problems with bio -bowing? Uh Yeah, so definitely something that's a bigger problem is uh, hard, what we call hard bodied organisms like barnacles. Um, when those grow directly on the sensor, then it's a huge problem because, uh, you know, A, they're, uh, they're totally sealing off the sensor. And then B, they might be hard to remove without damaging the sensor itself. Um, you know, hopefully that's, they just come off easily, but there's no guarantee of that. Um, but anything can be a problem if it's totally blocking the sensor. Like even like, say a snail or a crab walks in front of the sensor that might have an impact on the data. But yeah, definitely barnacles are a big issue. Good question. So you got to do a couple different things with this project, looking at the bow valley, looking at the crabs, and uh, which part was your favorite? Um, yeah. I really enjoyed field work in general, but I think my favorite project was probably uh, the crab, the crab data. It was, um, there was a lot of data analysis to be done, but it was really cool, like, just to know that there are real organisms behind it. And like, I was also the first one to do this data analysis of this crab data. It's been collected for a period of three years, and I was the first one to do any kind of data analysis on it. So that was that was kind of exciting. Okay, so now I'll talk about my Falmouth Public School collaboration. So for my project, I collaborated with Caitlin Church, 
Uh, she teaches seventh grade at Lawrence School in Falmouth. And together we designed a project uh, that is designed to provide students with information about salt marshes and how um, scientific research is done, specifically research on salt marshes, but also about water quality that um, water quality monitoring that uh, Buzzards Bay Coalition does long term. And so in order to achieve this goal, we created an interactive map uh, using Google Maps. And on this map, we have different pins with all of the different salt marsh sites. And so if you click on one of those pins, what comes up is a little bit of information, a little bit of text, photos uh, about uh, research methods, about um, what kind of crabs are we seeing at each site, and, and so on. And so I'll show an example of that. So here's a sample of our map. Um, so this map is just showing Buzzards Bay. And in green, we have the salt marsh sites. That blue marker is the site of my biofouling bio experiment, um, Redbrook Harbor. So this is labeled. There's a little short uh, description of the site. And then on the top there, I know it's pretty small, but I'll zoom in that on it uh, on the next slide. There's an image that you can click on and it enlarges. And there's some information on there to uh, teach students about um, water quality monitoring and also about the biofouling experiment that I did and the purpose of it. So here's that, here's that uh, image enlarged. So I just meant this to be as sort of an infographic with just a little bit of information about it, um, about the research. So on the left, we have information about water quality monitoring and the little picture of the data loggers and the frame they're attached to. On the right, we have in the information about the biofouling experiment. So I thought it was really important that um, there be a lot of photos and uh, information about like what actually happens with the research because um, I feel like at least for me, when I was in school, research seemed something that was really abstract to me. And um, scientific research was something that people did in, you know, lab coats, like in a lab, but that's not what research is, like entirely, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of field work, there's a lot of getting your hands dirty and going out to salt marshes, putting the traps in the ground, stuff like that. So it was really important to me that I show a lot of pictures of actual field work. And also just showing pictures is a good way to uh, visually provide an understanding of what's going on. And then also providing pictures of the organisms we're seeing helps to bring a little bit more, um, you know, sort of more solid like understanding of what are the actual organisms behind all of this data and text. So that's all I have. <laughs> Yeah, what we had talked about was um, making it a resource that was just available to them at any time so they could they would just be given a link and it would be accessible to them and they could open it whatever they wanted to to just learn some more about it but i imagine that it would be incorporated into um into a lesson uh dealing with these topics any other questions for Alicia? all right thank you well done thank you. Jordan said, wonderful job. All right, so th that concludes all of our presentations for today. I think that all of our presenters deserve another round of applause. For all right, um, now I'm gonna turn on the camera for the room. <laughs> All right, so now everybody, everybody, everybody on Zoom still hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> can people on Zoom still hear me? 
Yes. Thank you. Just wanted to check. All right. Um, so I wanted to say a thank you again to all of our partners, so the six Woodsole institutions, Buzzards Bay Coalition, Cape Cod Cooperative Extension, uh, Barnstable County, and Woodsole Sea Grant for supporting PEP and supporting PEP2. Huge thank you to all of our mentors. We literally couldn't run a program without our research mentors. So I want to give our mentors a round of applause. <laughs> I want to thank the Falmouth Public Schools for being willing to do this collaboration, being so open to um, providing the space and the time and some pay for the teachers to participate, uh, specifically Christina, Gina, and Caitlin for being willing to participate this summer, and we look forward to seeing uh, this implemented in your classroom. Um, just a side note, I did write an NSF grant in hopes that we could make PEP2 a year-long program that would have all the same components and hopefully allow the researchers to actually get to do the work in the classroom. So. Uh, fingers crossed, you know, say some prayers that we get that funding because that would be really awesome to be able to bring people back to Woods Hole for a whole year and actually do a longer project and be able to actually see their work in the classroom. Um, I also want to thank the PEP staff, Monet for sure, for managing all the logistics of everything. <laughs> Dr. Bill and George for being advisors and helping us uh, make sure that everything run smoothly. So before I let you all go, we're going to do a graduation ceremony. Um, so I think what we might do is I think I'll turn this camera up. I'll move my computer here because I know there's some friends and family online who probably want to see that as well. So if I could have George come up. I don't know why Miles is still there. <laughs> oh, my fault. Sorry. But don't talk because it's going to bring you back up. <laughs> 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 so we can have, um, yeah, Dr. Gerald and Monet, if you'll come up as well. Yeah. Well, they're all over here, so okay. let's move over here. But you guys don't have to go so far. <laughs> students to see such great presentations before they present tomorrow. So I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow we have the PEP presentations in Clark 507. That's at Police Quisic campus. They start at 9 a.m. and go until 2 p.m. Um, all are welcome. It will also be available on Zoom for anybody who's not able to attend in person. And we, we do have um, 
a photographer who will be here for a couple minutes. Uh, so if we want to take some more group pictures. We can do that before you all go on. All right, and George wants to. So there is a spin-off program. Pep, Pep, <laughs> Pep is it, among many other wonderful things that's done with all the great, great uh, students who have come through, scholars, scientists who have come through Pep. Uh, we have established a Pep-like program uh, that uh, operates outside, largely outside of Woods Hole. The symposium for that um, is this afternoon from at 11, starting at 11 and Thursday after, uh, Friday afternoon at 11. All of you should be in the PEP symposium. You should all go to the PEP symposium. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but where it doesn't conflict with InFish, you're welcome to tune into the uh, InFish uh, symposium. It's online, uh, it's virtual, and we'll be ha having it here in this room. But go to the PEP. We'll go to the Pep Symposium where the two conflict, all right? Thank you. All right, thank you everybody for joining us today and we'll be around for a little while if anybody wants to, to hang out a bit.